We're looking at uh, the last uh, one section of the Sermon on the Mount that uh, Don read for us in Matthew chapter 5. We'll be focusing on verse 30, 43, but he started reading a few verses before that because Jesus ties this all together. So just zooming out again, uh, you'll hear me say this over and over because even for me, as I study this, it, it's kind of confronting years of not misunderstanding about what this is about, but probably an incomplete understanding of what are we really about as followers of Jesus. So again, that God created things so good in the beginning because he himself is good, as we just sung. But that's been so hijacked by evil. And me and you experience that every moment of every day. But because God is good, he has is, he is sent good news. And not in just a message or a philosophy or a teaching, but in a person. And Jesus is that person. And so Jesus came to inaugurate, to start a kingdom movement of transformation, of renewal, uh, in our lives and the lives of everybody on earth, including all nations. And that's why we have that focus of going to Mexico, going to Albania, going to Tanzania, to Japan, to Tunisia, to all of these places that we support. God is creating a movement of transformation in the lives of people. And he's doing it through the lives of people. He's not just doing it through a message or he's just not doing it through certain called people, but he's doing it through this movement called the church. And that's you. That includes all of us. And so this movement of renewal it happens through people who are now Jesus in the flesh, who have found a whole new humanity because they, they know this Jesus for themselves. They've been changed by him. They see things differently. And that's what we're supposed to be. And so often in churches, and, and even though I grew up in a great church, I think my understanding was these are good things to know and to understand, but not necessarily to be transformed by and to see the world differently. And so a part of our testimony, which we've shared, is that God transformed how we saw the world, how we saw ourselves, how we saw him, how we saw the church. And so that's why we're so passionate about what we're doing here and trying to reach the world with this good news. And that is Jesus Christ. He changes people's lives through the church. And so that's why we're going through the Sermon on the Mount as he describes what, who is the church? What does it look like to be a follower of this Jesus? And then practically, how, how does this work, work out in our lives? When you look at the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, you could... If you've got the red letter Bible, you can see how long it is. And it takes minutes to read. It takes months and years to study, but it takes an absolute lifetime to implement. And that's why we're trying to go slow through it and pick apart the words and what Jesus is really saying. Remember, at the very end of this, in, in this collection of teachings of Jesus, the crowd was astonished. We should be astonished. When we encounter these words, if we're listening to the spirit speaking to us, we should feel him just absolutely confronting us and just being astonished at the life that he's calling us to. So that's what we've been talking about. So I hope you've been able to grasp that a little bit and just, again, see yourself as one that God is pursuing to transform into someone new, to be a part of a whole new humanity, be a part of a whole new movement who lives a completely different life, who brings a unique message to the entire world. We're going to explore that this morning. Here, he, he brings this whole teaching to a climax with a very, very simple command to love and to pray. And so this morning, we're talking about loving your enemies. Janet, can you click easy worship for me? Right, we're talking about... Loving your enemies. And I had Don read a little bit earlier because Jesus ties the two together. Okay. That how we deal with, with people who are angry at us or treat us badly or uh, do whatever, kind of act toward, unjustly towards us. How do we respond to that? Do we respond with revenge and getting even? No, we, we, we love them. We serve them because we're called to love our enemies. And so these kind of, these two kind of last week and this week kind of go together. And when you really think about it, every religion, every philosophy, every kind of school of thought in the world picks up on this exact teaching, this, this teaching of Jesus. It's the only place you'll find it, but they pick up on it because they, they know there's something there of loving those that aren't like us or that treat us bad. Every religion has morals and laws 
But it's only the Christian faith. It's only the life of Jesus that brings us to this unique level. This level of, I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes, this level of completion or finality or fulfillment. And that's why it's so hard. It is so hard for us. Well, a number of years ago, I was on a plane uh, flying from uh, Nairobi to the coast of Kenya. You might have to click it for me. I'm not sure what's happening. Oh, actually, if you take my blue stick out, that's probably why. Take my blue stick out and put the other one. Thanks. So a couple of years ago, uh, we, were, we were flying from Nairobi down to the coast of Kenya. It's a, a place called Mombasa. And as we were flying along, the, the pilot kind of comes on the PA and he goes, uh, if everybody wants to look out your right window, you'll see the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. And so we kind of, everybody looks and you see this majestic, gorgeous mountain just poking out through the clouds. It's this, this towering hunk of rock. Several months later, uh, friends of ours, some of you know them, Brian and Jessica Mirholm and, and us, we, or I guess myself, went down to Tanzania and we, we decided to climb this thing. And so we took a bus and we'd spent a whole day driving down and, and it, you go through what a lot of you would understand as the Serengeti, right? It's the ultimate game park there. And it's just this flat kind of barren land where you have gorgeous animals and stuff. But right in the middle of this flat land, you again, there's this towering mountain that pokes up. It's the highest point on the whole continent. And you just look at this majestic thing. He's like, how am I going to get up there? How can we possibly reach the top of this? And this is a bit of a picture of what Jesus is doing here. You know, we all kind of stand on the, the, the ground level and we look at this towering climactic teaching of absolutely loving and praying for those that hurt us, that hate us, that are undermining us, or maybe out to get us in some way, when it just goes so against who we are. Jesus here is ultimately talking us to a new level of relating to one another. It's a towering monumental task of how do we invest in relationships in, with, in one another? Because relationships is the highest priority in the kingdom of God. It's not about religion and doing a bunch of stuff like this. The person sitting beside you or in front of you, or behind you, or the person that you rub shoulders with through the week. That is what the kingdom is about. And Jesus has placed you there to be a part of this movement of transformation. And so he's been talking about practically, what does this look like? How do we deal with anger when I just get angry? When my values are being challenged, when people are, are going against what I want my life to be about. And he, and he says that that's like murder. How do you look at someone who's attractive and is going to see God-given beauty and, and not fall into lust? How do we be honor? Uh, how do we be honest with one another? How do we knock seat revenge when, when someone does something against us? These words, when a community is transformed by Jesus, becomes a means of transformation in a whole community, in a whole country, in a whole world. These are words that literally transforms communities. And that's why we're focusing on them so much. I, I just want to give you a, a, maybe a picture or put yourself in a, in a place where maybe you have to wrestle with these things. But I'm going to do it in the first century. Let's pretend you are a, a Jewish person. Okay. And uh, you live up in Galilee where this guy Jesus has, has come. And uh, you have been out on the Sea of Galilee fishing. You, you don't have a lot. Um, but you're trying to make your wage. So you go out and you go fishing and you, you get your catch, you know, maybe minimal, minimal, but it's just enough. And then you walk back towards your village or one of the villages nearby and you click that for me. And, and then you come to the first person on the edge of the village and it's a tax collector. Okay. Uh, you, can, you can probably come up with a few names and he, and he catches you walking in and he reminds you of what you owe yet. And that you, 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 you owe it today. Actually, you owed it months ago. But you, know, you need to pay me because I see you got some fish. And it says, you got to give some. Well, I, I can't. Like, I've got, I've got kids and I've got neighbors. And he leans over and he smacks you across the face. In front of everybody, your neighbors, and maybe even your kids coming out to greet you because he's a really small village. And just to shame you, he smacks you across the face. What are you going to do? Roman soldiers are standing right there. You do anything against the tax collector, they're ready to break your kneecaps. Uh, they're the same guy that, you know, just, just the last Sabbath, you were, went out to the lake again and you just enjoyed a day of rest. 
And as you were doing that, you saw this, this small group of soldiers that you recognize one of them. He comes, they come and buy and, and you know, it's trouble as soon as they show up and, and you can see the stuff that they're carrying. And then, and then he says, Hey dog, get up, pick up my bag. And I want you to carry it with me. This is your Sabbath now. Well, you don't dare go against that. So you get up and you, you pick up these bags. And you have to leave your family. You're going against your, your religion of not working on the Sabbath. What do you do? You finally get home and, and you realize that your donkey has gone into the neighbor's uh, field and wrecked some of his, his grain. And so now he's going to sue you for things that you don't have. What are you going to do? These are the teachings of Jesus when he says, you don't retaliate, you don't hate. In fact, you need to love them. You need to serve them. What are you going to really do? Do you have the capacity to do it? This was the debate going on when Jesus shows up in this teaching. You are as a first century Israelite have been hearing these teachings of Jesus, this interesting guy, but you've had these life experiences. Okay. You've been growing up hearing the Pharisees teaching on these various kinds of issues. And you realize that they've been dis- distorting this command of love. And so we're going to talk about love this morning, how love has been distorted. But in Jesus, we lo- see love displayed and then we're going to receive the, lo- the command to love extravagantly. Love distorted. So the debate that was going on at this time is how do you love that tax collector that smacks you? The Roman soldier that makes you break the Sabbath law or to be sued by your neighbor. What do you do? Who counts in this command to love? Is there conditions on that? Is there boundaries to that? Do you, we only love who, who loves us? How do we, how do we wrestle with this? And so Jesus picks up on, on this debate that was going on in verse 43. Again, we've been talking about this debate that's been going on. But the Pharisees have been giving different teachings. And, and at the time, you can see Jesus said, you've heard it said that it was to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And it's interesting, if you notice how, it, how Jesus, we'll see in the next verse, how, how we, people focus on what's been said versus what is written. And we do that all the time. What's been said by my favorite author or my favorite podcast or favorite pastor or, or whoever versus what does the word say? And so the leaders were distorting this teaching, like love your neighbor, but hate those that are against you. Well, how, how do we discern who he's talking about? Well, Jesus, as, as he has been doing, he's going back to the Old Testament law and say, well, let's see what the law actually says and see how the Pharisees have been distorting it. And so he goes back to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. It's just one part of the whole law. And he says there, uh, God says to his people, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one, uh, anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord or I am Yahweh. And so who is your neighbor there? Can you, can you see it? Against anyone among your people. So your neighbor is your people, right? It's, if you're the Israelite there, your neighbor is the fellow Israelites. Okay. So does, does the trader tax collector who's been spacking you, does, is, does he count? It's, it's basically a Roman now because he switched sides, right? Uh, is, is the Roman soldier your neighbor? Well, probably not. He's Roman. We're underneath his, his oppressive rule. So does he count? Do other Gentiles or other nations count? That was the debate. Another part of this law that, that Jesus kind of refers to in Matthew chapter 19, verse 33 and 34, we see here as well. Uh, if you kind of go down farther in, in that teaching, it says, do not take advantage of foreigners. Okay. This is Gentiles or people, non-Israelites who live among you in your land. Treat them like native born Israelites and love them as you love yourself. Remember that you were once foreigners living in the land of Egypt, going back to many, a couple thousand years ago. I am Yahweh, the Lord, your God. This is what the law said. And so we can see what the Pharisees have done now. If they've taken it and and they've twisted it, Uh, they've done two things. The first one was they, they narrowed what love, the love command. They narrow who we are supposed to love. It says, in in the law that you were to love your neighbor, like who? As yourself. But they've taken that out. 
So they've redefined, first of all, neighbor to pe- be people like us. So you love people like you. As, as I say that does, that, does that ring a bell about the time that we've come through? We love people like us. We, like, we, we love Israelites. We love people who think like I do, who look like I do, who make decisions like I do, who, who believe the same kinds of things. But then they've also taken out this word as yourselves. You notice how in, when Jesus says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor, period. The, the, the condition, the boundaries have changed. They've taken out as yourselves, which is the highest standard. Who do you advocate for all the time? Who do you get mad about? Who do, who do you, whose values do you always defend? It's, it's yourself. It's the, it's the highest standard that we always pursue. And so they, they've taken that away. They've changed the definition of neighbor and they've taken away the highest standard as yourselves. But then they also added a command. They added another part that wasn't in there. And, and if you think about it, we do this all the time. If we, if we come to a conclusion about one thing, somehow we jump to the conclusion that it means something else. We, we assume the opposite, that if I'm only to love these kind of people, by implication, I'm supposed to hate these kind of people. And we do that all the time. And so what is in Matthew is not in the law. What the Pharisees say about hating this person who is against you, your enemy, it's not in the command. In fact, it's the exact opposite. But they're like us. Where we assume that if, if I just love the people like me, then that means I can advocate against and hate and undermine anybody who's against me. And in the teaching of the time, the, the most religious people that do pop up in the gospel were the Essenes. Uh, we have this historical do- document pile called the Dead Sea Scrolls. I've referred to this before. If you go from Jerusalem down towards the, the Dead Sea, you come to a place called Qumran. And it was a Qumran community who wanted to be just so faithful to the law. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are, are translations of, of Old Testament writings, there's some commentaries in there, ways of re- um, living a religious life in there. And they clearly teach to hate, like hate your enemy. They bought into that. And even those that wanted to be so faithful to the law. So that was the debate that was going on. The Pharisees were wrestling, what, what, what is this law to love? And is there limits to it? And so they taught that there is. And then an additional command of hating. So Jesus shows up. And there's this big word that we always skip over in, Eng- or in our English translations. It's the word but. It's the, it's, the, it's the flipping point. And Jesus says, wait a minute, there's something different. Uh, This love distorted has actually been displayed in a different way. And in himself, love has been displayed. And we see that in verse 44. So he goes on to say, but I tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus is so torn by the very fundamental part of who he is and the fundamental charge to love everybody that he speaks up. So I want to come back to the, to the picture of you as as that Israelite who's been smacked in front of your community, you've been, you know, dishonored by the Roman soldiers, you've been sued by your neighbor, you as a disciple of Jesus, what do you do? What do you do in that moment? You know, a lot of people think that Christians or disciples are, are doormats, that the command to love your enemy just means, okay, you just walk right over me. Or we're never to take revenge. We're never to hate anybody. So we just do nothing. And that's not what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying be a doormat or just not revenge or or just sit there and do nothing. He says something absolutely profound that the world was wrestling with. And that is to hold the highest standard of human relationships. And that is to love these people and to pray, which means you're advocating for their renewal and their success. So what happens in a follower of Jesus, this level of transformation we've been talking about is something inside you calls you to go to that tax collector who smacked you outside of the head in front of your community. And you look at him and you say, it looks like you've had a stressful week. It, it, you just look like you have so much to let go. Can you, 
can I give you the other one so you can do that again? So you can get it out? It says to that Roman soldier, that like, it must be so tiring carrying all these bags for all this while. Can I take it to your front door? This person who's suing you for your undergarment, you say, actually, it sounds like I've really wronged you. And even if it's too much, can I give you the outer one as well? The one that we sleep in and it keeps us warm. Can I give you the outer garment as well? It brings us to this level of, of love, of agape that the world just doesn't understand. This powerful movement that, that literally transforms people in relationships because it puts us into this place where other people are put before us. It's the hardest thing to do. So this last week for me, um, you know, I've really enjoyed this, this study for myself. And, and as the one who stands up here, I feel very accountable. And so I've been working so hard. It's been contemplating these teachings for myself and just, God, what does this look like in my life? And, and so um, I was able to do a long drive to a commute to a, a work site this week, uh, which I normally don't get to do. I live five minutes, so my drive isn't very contemplative. So I was like, I'm going to take advantage of this. This is great. It's a beautiful day. I'm driving nice and, and you know, I'm praying and, and just really enjoying this quiet time and, and just asking God, how what does this mean for me in my life? And so as I'm going down highway two, you know, I'm in this great place. And this guy comes up right on my tail as we're trying to pass a series of trucks. And I'm behind a bunch of cars that are kind of moving slow too. And he just like right up on my bumper and he's driving a Mercedes to make it even worse. Right. And so I'm just like, God, you know, I'm just thinking, God, like what, what, what's, you know, what's going on in my heart and anger or lust or, or my marriage or being honest with people. I just want to follow you. And like, what is your problem? And it was so quick. I was just like, seriously, back off, right? And I could tell you what I wanted to do. I didn't do it. And I've never done that, to be honest, but I really wanted to. It is so hard to, to love, to, to actually be a follower of Jesus when you're sitting by yourself in your own car. And it just made me so much matter when I finally pulled over and he gave me the thumbs up as he went by. I was like, Really? It is so hard from the deepest part of us. And it was such a get check moment. Like, do you believe this or not? Is Jesus alive in you or not? Is he bringing a level of transformation in you or not? This is hard. Next, next one there, Janae. It's agape love. It's agape love. Well, he, he kind of goes on to describe this. Where, where did Jesus ultimately get this from? Actually, go back a couple. Sorry, our PowerPoint's not working today. It's in, he kind of goes on to describe what this love is in two ways. The uh, first one he does is he describes the weather. And then he talks about a movement of God in, in Scripture that isn't as explicit, but we see it in the person of Jesus. So the first one he does is he talks about indiscriminate blessing by talking about the weather. And so he goes on and he says, uh, so love your enemies and pray for your, uh, pray for your, those who are persecuting you, that you may be sons and daughters of your father in heaven. Who is this father? He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So we're, we're in planting season. So this is a great, great analogy, a great time to kind of talk about this, you know, um, a lot of you are out in the fields right now, or maybe starting to plant gardens. And my guess is, uh, let's say in four weeks, you're driving down the road and, uh, you started to see, you know, green popping up in people's fields. Or you might drive by a yard and you can see their, their garden starting to grow. And you say to yourself, well, since that's happening, this person must be a follower of Jesus. Cause look what's happening. Their, their work is bearing fruit. It's, it's, it's starting to grow. And then you drive down the road a little bit farther and you see a field that's been planted and nothing's growing. And you say, that must be a pagan. Someone who doesn't follow Jesus. Is that what we do? No. We drive down the road and you see in all of those fields, you see the seeds starting to grow. You see uh, things germinating. You see fruit start to happen. I woke up this morning and um, even though it was an early morning, it was a short night. I, 
I was able to get done things quick and I went outside and I was like, this gorgeous day for in my yard is the same one that my neighbor is experiencing this morning. It was gorgeous. This indiscriminate love, this indiscriminate blessing, rain, sun, money, food, food on a table, everything comes to the righteous and the unrighteous. And you, we have adopted in, in the church today that if things are going wrong, you are not being blessed. And if you, if things are going well, that means God's favor is shining down on you. And Jesus says, that is terrible theology, terrible we are in this season where the father causes the sun and the rain and everything to, to rain down on the good and the evil, the righteous and the unrighteous. Even every breath is given to even those who don't deserve it. It's indiscriminate. And so when you look at a tax collector or a tyrant, even those people love those who love them. Verse 46, if you love those who love you, uh, what reward will you get? Are you are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans, which means non-Jewish people, do that. Uh, we're called to something else. See, people who are not followers of Jesus like those that like them. will serve those who, who kind of give kickbacks to their own lives. Jesus calls us to a different, what we call ethic way of living is that what we have been giving through the father, we are to spread generously, indiscriminately. Whereas to our, our enemies, to the guy riding up on your bumper, you want judgment. We want accountability. We want to make things right. And Fair enough. In terms of God's economy, yes, judgment is coming. But in God's economy today, not yet. And not through us. We're meant to follow what God does. And, and he just spreads sun and rain and blessing on everybody. That's what's been displayed for us. And then he goes on to a second argument about how this love displayed has, is really the intended purpose for all of us. And, and, he goes back to this, this, or he goes to a verse that we really struggle with when we read it. It's in verse 48. So after we talk about this, this loving your enemies and praying for those that persecute you and, and sharing love generously, indiscriminately, abundantly, because even, you know, people who don't follow Jesus love those that love them, you know, that love them, but we're supposed to love more than that. So that's kind of, that's the first argument. But then he goes and say, but you've been created to do that. And we see that in this verse 48, be perfect. Therefore, as your father is perfect. When we read that verse, we say, well, forget it. I'm done. I, I, I'm, I'm not perfect. I can't be perfect. Like, how do we live up to that? Well, the key to this verse is actually looking at the Greek. And it's a whole sermon in itself. But the Greek word here is not our English word of, of perfect or perfection. This word, it's hard to describe in English, but it's, it's like arrival. It's destination. If you are looking for a place that you want to go, it's called telos. It, it's like that, that place where when you get there and you arrive, it's in the, in the spiritual way, it's, it's maturity. It's, it's coming to a place of completion, reaching the end, wanting nothing, becoming completely satisfied. It's not that you, you do all the things right. It's get into a place where we have grown mature as God intended us to be. And we lack nothing. We desire nothing more than what we've already received in him. And so it comes across as a command, but what's really important for us is that this is also a promise. That when we act as Jesus does towards those that cross our boundaries right? People not within our tribe. Okay. We tribalize so much. Uh, those that kind of are, are constantly in conflict with us. We act generously. We respond, we serve. And when, 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 a, when a person does that, or when a community does that, you will never see a greater example of true humanity. You are never more like God then when you are taking on the form of a servant and loving those that you believe don't deserve it. 
That's what he's saying here. Be perfect, therefore, as your father is perfect, which means become the true human that you were intended to be. Just as your father acted in the interest of the other, that's what you're to do. And when we do that, we get to a place where we lack nothing, where we actually desire nothing else. Because you're doing exactly, one, what you were created to do, but more importantly, exactly who God, what God did for, him, for us. And so when we serve the interest of the other, it's amazing. You think that that's such a hard place, but you, you actually get to a place of complete satisfaction. So loving is what we've been intended to do. And when we love in that way, we actually become quote unquote perfect. We become mature. We've, we've arrived at that destination of completion. And there's no more striving. There's no more guilt. There's no more shame because you're doing exactly what God has created you to do. And so the command that we've been given here is to love extravagantly. Like wh- what does this mean? Love. I love donuts. Like I really love donuts. Okay. I, I love hockey. Last night I, you know, I hurt my voice yelling at the game. I love motorbiking. I love my family. I love my church. I love God. What does that mean? Love in the English language is like the worst word ever because we're talking about donuts and God in the same word. But when we look in, in scripture, we see a completely different word. Uh, scripture has four words for these things that we describe as love in English. You know, in English, we talk about emotions. We talk about, we talk about tastes. We talk about preferences. We talk about time off. I talk about relationships. But in agape, it's not emotions or feelings or what happens to you. It's something different. It's this this thing that we see in Jesus, this thing, the self-sacrifice, emptying yourself of everything you you, you think you have a prerogative to. And, And it describes how you treat those that hurt you. It describes how you serve those who undermine you, who even hate you. And so love is not a feeling like our culture describes. Uh, Anytime you talk about love in scripture or you hear people talk about it, you hear about two things. One, attitude. Two, action. When you're called to love the people that you really quite frankly hate or very angry with, he's not calling you to act out of emotion or a feeling, but he's calling you to act out of a choice. That somewhere, again, see that, that thing that just down in here that God has absolutely transformed calls you to go past the warm fuzzies or the lack thereof and to choose to see that person, remember relationships, choose to see that person, how God sees them, that, that they're created in his image, that, that they're lost, that they're maybe hurting. And when we look at the, God, at the world that we live in, we, we were supposed to see God's image messed up. But it's a world that has been purchased. We talked about that last week. Purchased at an unbelievable cost. And we have no right to stand where we stand and say, you don't deserve to be loved by me. You deserve judgment. You deserve accountability. You deserve to face the consequences of your choices. And I want nothing to do with it. We have no right to be there. The only right that we have is to love. And that's a choice. That's an attitude, a disposition. And then his foot comes out in an action. It takes this belief, this heart, this choice, and we serve. We lift that person up as best as we can. We seek to redeem them through prayer. And when we do that, we see in verse 45, jumping back a little bit, the that there is a, is a therefore a result Love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. And the result of that is going to be verse 45, where you now will be sons and daughters of your father in heaven. Now that doesn't mean a lot of us hear this as a works righteousness. Okay, I got to do this to be okay. No. But we do this to show that we're okay. We do this to exemplify the fact that I have been chosen by my father and I'm a part of his family. It's an action that that exemplifies that we're kingdom people. We're a part of this movement. And we want to be used by God to bring about transformation in people's lives. 
how did, how did Jesus teach people to, to start working through this and, and, and implement it to some degree? Throughout scripture, we see Jesus having, there's, there's many ways you could describe it, but redeeming dinners, meals. He calls people to eat. And that's why on, on Good Friday, we, we had a meal where the taste and the smell and, and, and the storytelling that goes on that kind of is symbolic in the elements, it, it leads us to this place of experiencing God's love. And so over and over, people are having a meal with Jesus. And it's interesting that when he was about to be betrayed and crucified, Jesus brings a meal. And the meal itself is a remembrance. It, it brings us down the road of remembering what true agape is. And so today I wanted to invite you to a meal that Jesus called us to observe as often as we want. But it's a meal that I would like you to come to and, and, and use it as an opportunity to examine your heart a little bit. Again, this is the summary, the climax, the mountaintop of his teaching and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so when you come to the table, come carefully, ask yourself some questions and use the example that Jesus had put before us. Uh, to to kind of set this up, I'd like us to turn to 1 John chapter 4, because I, I'm thinking that John must have had this teaching in mind when he said these incredible words to us. So John chapter 4, he talks about when do we love and why do we love? And if you listen to these words and you'll hear the heartbeat of God and what he's calling us to be and to do. 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7, he says this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. Think of display here. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to atone as an atoning sacrifice, a covering for our sins. Dear friends, notice the plea here. Since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, catch this, if we love one another, God lives in us, telos, arrival, completion, maturity, satisfaction, and his love is made telos in us, complete. We are to love. And so if you want to experience all that God has for you and, and to have that sense of completion and satisfaction, it's found in one, receiving his love for yourself that we see in Jesus. And we remember that through the table. But remember, it's also a command and a promise that we can go and do this ourselves. And just as we've been redeemed, we literally can be a redeeming force in our community and in our country and in the world. But we got to own this. This has to be who we are. And it's going to take some time. We're going to have those moments of sitting in our car. And that's okay. And that's why we just do this together. We remind each other every week. We encourage each other. We pray for one another. But God is faithful in giving us his promise. So as you come to the table, I ask you to do two things. I ask you to pray. Pray for yourself. God, how am I, my concept of love distorted? Who do I hate? Who hates me? Who I despise? Who am I bitter against? Who am I avoiding and undermining? Who am I retaliating against? And just confess that. Bring that to the table and confess that. Maybe, maybe there's someone in this room that hate you maybe hate, despise, or bitter, angry against. They, they maybe hate you. How do, we, how do we reconcile that as we come to the table? Maybe you need to cross the floor while songs are being sung and, and just pray with that person. Is that what not the body a family does? That's hard, isn't it? Isn't that scary? But that's what we're called to. That's the level of transformation that happens 
in the body when we truly love each other. So this is a time for you to respond to Jesus' command and promise to love and to pray for your enemies. So as our servers will come, let's, let's just spend a few moments in quiet asking the Lord to reveal these things to us and how he is calling us to love and to pray. Father, we thank you so much that uh, behind every call and command and promise is you. The command to love one another and to love our enemies, to serve, is always followed up by this great statement, I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. You are the standard. You are the source and the beginning. You are our Father. You were the one that created a way for us to come back to you. You displayed that through this incredible gift of your son. The one who emptied himself of every prerogative and took on the form of a servant because of your love for us, your love for the world that you gave your only son. God, this is something that we don't have to generate. We often try to do that. But this is more something that we just need to receive. And we can only receive it when we're willing to surrender it. Surrender ourselves. And if we're all honest here this morning, we're, we're struggling with things that we're hanging on to. The opportunity to take revenge, the opportunity to use something against someone else, the opportunity to ignore. And it just hurts us so much. Father, I just pray that you would bring to mind those that we struggle with, those that we may be angry at, the ones that we're hurting by getting even ones that we refuse to serve. And I just pray that we'd be brought to a place of confession. But then we'd also be brought to a place of reconciliation. That if it's right, if it's good, that we maybe go to that person or those people and we make things right. And thank you for the promise that we can be made whole and complete and live in the sense of arrivalness of the kingdom that we can be changed from the inside out we can be a part of a family that has been made sons and daughters of god that we can go from here and, and live a new way of living see the world through a new lens see hurting people who hurt us not as as jerks or as people that care about us but hurting people who who need jesus and, and i can be jesus in the flesh to them God, these are so hard for us to do. I mean, really, when we explore the depths of this, we are, we're astonished of what you're calling us to. Yet I'm so thankful that this call, this command is accompanied by your presence. The Holy Spirit that speaks to our hearts and reminds us who we are, reminds us of the intention of creation. And God, I just pray that we would listen to that voice. That even what's happening here this morning as we come to the table, as we take these elements that symbolize your broken body for us and your spilled blood for us, was an atoning sacrifice, a coveting sacrifice, so that we can receive love and now extend love and literally, literally transform our community. God, we have prayed for revival in our community so many times. Uh, we've prayed for our neighbors or our friends or our schools or our workmates, whatever, we prayed for these people and, and we just long so much for something new to happen. And so we just ask for your promise to be made full here. But we ask that recognizing it starts with us. And so as we come to the pit table, I pray that something mysterious and powerful would happen. 
that your people would be changed. And because we're changed, and we go as, as a united body of family of God, that we, we become Jesus in the flesh to everyone we encounter this week. And when we mess up, we, we, we ask for your forgiveness. We, we ask people to come alongside us. And we just do it again. So just come with us and, and be with us as we come to the table. And I pray that you would just find us faithful in listening to your voice. Thank you for your patience and for your love. Thank you for this incredible teaching of Jesus when we really wrestle with the depths of it. And I just pray that this place would be a source of love and transformation. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.